two years abroad gathering up gemstones and jewels. So I, that collection must have been outstanding. Well, certainly from the accounts of the time, the, the crew of the ship were just amazed by mm, what I, they saw. I can imagine. One of them described his cabin was almost a fire with jewels for shining. And then on the voyage back, it seems he was poisoned. Oh, my goodness. And his body was tossed overboard. Um, and then once the ship arrived off the English coast, the ship's carpenter jumped ship with the booty and really? headed up to the capital. He then tried to sell this material on the London market. Do you think some of these stones could have ended up in the hall? Well, there were many hundreds of thousands of them, and it's entirely possible. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Londoners' love of dressing up and adornment fueled the international jewel trade. For the growing merchant class, wearing expensive jewellery was a way of signalling their newfound status and confidence. This is Margaret Cotton, the wife of a wealthy merchant. You can see here she's wearing a ring on her little finger, just as we would do today. But up here, you can also see she's had one sewn into her ruff. Rings and other jewels were also attached to girdles and cuffs, basically anywhere you could show off your wealth. Whether nouveau riche or royalty, high society in the early 17th century was all about display. Wealthy women piled their hair high with eye-catching clasps and droplets. Fashionable men wore jewels sewn into their caps and cloaks. Even as fashions became simpler and more restrained, ordinary items like buttons could still be encrusted with gemstones. With such a demand for jewels and such large profits to be made, it maybe wasn't surprising that some traders were prepared to cut corners. So Hazel, what do we have here? Two very different looking objects. And intriguing objects too. Let's just start quickly with this one, which is magnificent. Two fabulous sapphires and a very valuable gemstone, mm. the spinel, all from Sri Lanka. Beautiful piece. And the spinel has been drilled from both ends. And the, the, the cutter's made a bit of an error, and he started off drilling and gone completely offline. Oh, you can see that. Rather like a zigzaggy caterpillar yeah. all the way through. I bet he was quite angry with himself drilling that. But you only get one go, I suppose. Yeah. He must have been very annoyed, and particularly because the material was so valuable. Mm. So there was a real market for counterfeits, and this is one. Now, it may not look it now, because the colour has, has faded, but when this was first made, it was probably akin to that colour. Color. To that. I was wondering what this object was. So what this was meant mm. to look like was the rough spinel, and therefore very, very valuable stone. A man called Thomas Simpson, a jeweller in Cheapside, had a business or sideline in counterfeiting spinels. And what I think he probably did was rock crystal was heated to a kind mm. of red hot and then dropped into a bucket or container of cold dye impregnated water. Um, and that quench crackling, as it's known, wow. induced sort of thermal shock, opening up the fissures in, in the stone, up. and then the dye could filtrate in. Did he make a lot of money out of this counterfeit business? These were being sold at seven or eight thousand pounds a piece. Oh, my goodness. They, there was, that's a lot of money in those days. Huge amount of money. Gosh, what a rogue. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> what a rogue. Policing the jewellery trade was one of the main jobs of the company of goldsmiths. In the courtroom at their headquarters near Cheapside, they could pass stiff sentences on jewellers found guilty of having sold substandard or counterfeit goods. Today, the goldsmiths company still has a major role in quality control. In the back rooms of Goldsmiths Hall, gold and silver is tested for purity literally to check whether it comes up to scratch. It's a process that hasn't changed since the 17th century. Jewels also come to the assay office to be stamped with the famous leopard head hallmark. 
It's one of the oldest brand logos in the world, identifying a jewel as made in London and giving its quality in carrots and its year of manufacture. But when it comes to the cheap side hoard, there's a problem. Although larger gold and silver pieces were routinely hallmarked in the 17th century, none of the jewels from the hoard were ever stamped. So when it comes to dating the hoard, we have to rely on other clues. What we have here is a watch. It's a really sophisticated timepiece with um, calendar indications. The detailing on it is beautiful. But also, thankfully, it bears the signature of the maker. The initial G and then Furlight for Gautier Furlight. Do we, do we know this watchmaker? How well, thankfully, what yes. Was he? His father worked as the pastor of the Italian church in London. And then, uh, after his death, his mother remarried and the small family moved back to Geneva. And then Gautier was apprenticed to a clock watchmaker. And by um, the turn of the century, 1590, 1600, was um, master of the, the company. And the watch mm. probably dates to about 1610, 1620. Oh, really? But the really crucial bit of dating evidence for the hoard is this tiny piece, so from a quite large object to something really small, so small that it's been completely overlooked. This is a small carnelian seal, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And even with the damage, mm. you can just about work out that it's the heraldic badge of William Howard, Viscount Stafford. Now, Lord Stafford was created Viscount in 1640. So this little gem really is a very important part of the hoard because it gives us a date. The presence of this tiny little piece indicates that the hoard has to have been buried after 1640. William Howard's triumph at becoming a Viscount wasn't long-lasting. This was the tense lead-up to the English Civil War, and because the Howards had Catholic and Royalist sympathies, they left for the continent. In 1649, the same year as the King was executed, Lord Howard's estate was seized by Parliament. It's possible that the family jewels were sold off at this time, finding their way into the Cheapside hoard. Could the Civil War help answer that other great mystery? Why was the hoard buried? And why was it never retrieved? David, do you think the Civil War had a big impact on the cheap side jewellery trade? I think it definitely did. We don't have many references, but there is this entry in January 1643 when the Beadle, who collects the subscription, if you like, from the company, who says he's been doing it for 18 years, and this last half year he's tried to collect money from people, but he says there's no one to collect it from. Mm. He says some have gone for soldiers and many shops shut up. So do you think that one of these soldiers could have been responsible for burying the hoard and then unfortunately went off to war and got killed and never came back to reclaim it's it? It's quite possible and it seems to fit uh, reasonably well with the dating of the, of the objects in the hoard, so that is certainly one possibility. And do you think there could have been any other reasons why somebody would bury a hoard? But there were, from time to time, uh, bouts of plague and that was, of course, another, another reason why things might have been buried. Fear of, of getting the plague, where people would perhaps bury their worldly goods Good. and then take off out of, the, out of the city. Why not just take your stock with you? I suppose there was the fear that you, you may not be sure where you're going to and for how long, and it might be safer to bury it in one fixed place, and then you could return when times were better and, and more certain, perhaps. Civil war and plague might be reasons why the hoard was buried and forgotten. But there is another intriguing possibility, and it lies in that other great calamity of the 17th century. The Great Fire of London. Cheapside was ground zero, pretty much the dead centre of the huge swathe of the city destroyed by the Great Fire. If you'd been here on Wednesday the 5th of September 1666, you would have had to pick your way through a smouldering ruin of charred timbers and globs of melted glass and lead. Cheapside had been totally wiped out. But below ground, it was a different story. There were deep cellars down here that survived the devastating firestorm. 
when the Goldsmiths Company eventually rebuilt their property on 30 to 32 Cheapside, they just used the old undamaged vaults as foundations. And it was in this pre-fire layer that the demolition gang discovered the hoard centuries later. So was the hoard buried by someone fleeing the inferno, someone who, for whatever reason, wasn't able to return to dig it up again. It's a romantic idea, isn't it? The fire that destroyed London, preserving this perfect time capsule of its past. But the truth is, there's actually not much more evidence to support it than any of the other theories that have been suggested from time to time. In the end, the hoard of jewels discovered here beneath Cheapside is going to have to remain a mystery. And I think that's at least partially why we're still so entranced by it. The Cheapside Hoard is magical, alluring, truly wonderful. As you walk around the exhibition, you're constantly dazzled, not just by the beauty of the pieces, but by the tantalising traces of vibrant human lives. If I could take any piece home from the Cheapside Hoard, it would have to be this exquisite scent bottle. Made from gold, coated in enamel and set with beautiful gemstones. You have Hungarian opals, Indian diamonds, sapphires, pink and blue from Sri Lanka. When I saw it first, I instinctively wanted to pick it up and smell the scent. Obviously that evaporated hundreds of years ago, but the woman who owned it, how did she wear this scent bottle? Was it round her neck? Did she drape it off her dress? While driving through the smelly streets of London in those days, a smell from this bottle, was that her escape? This is a truly exquisite piece of jewellery. I hope the lady who owned this treasured it as much as I do. One of the reasons that we're so entranced by gold and gemstones is because their beauty never fades. But I think the jewels of the Cheapside Hoard offer something even more compelling. A magical glimpse into the vanished lives of those who have gone before. Their pride, greed and deceit. Their love, joy and devotion. All expressed through these objects of timeless beauty. Dreams and Demons and the Beach as the embodiment of a modern land. Our brand new series, The Art of Australia, continues next on BBC Four. And then at 10, a review show special as Kirsty Walk meets writer Donna Tartt in a brand new interview.